Okay, so the year is 1927, and Louis B. Meyer has an idea. You see, Louis had just co-founded MGM Studios, and in between making classic pictures and controlling the sex lives of his actors, Louis worried about industry folks unionizing. This, of course, would have been disastrous to his favorite hobby, arranging sham marriages between movie stars, so he co-founded a new organization. This would handle all those silly little labor concerns without the need for pesky unions. He called it the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. It had six branches for the six kinds of industry folks at the time. There were actors, directors, writers, producers, technicians, and those silent movie piano players. While the pianists ended up getting quickly phased out, the remaining five branches comprised some of the most influential Hollywood folks around, and they held their first banquet on January 11, 1927. But Louis knew there was more to this academy than just dinner parties for wealthy insiders. What if there were dinner parties for wealthy insiders that also gave out trophies? I think Louis put it best himself in the following quote. Dear unnamed friend, my brains have birthed an idea worthy of the blue ribbon. I'm concerned that the industry sees me as a controlling monster simply for monstrously controlling them. So, I've decided to give them shiny statues so they stop complaining about me. These simpletons will be crowding my studio like a group of Irishmen in a haberdashery. Seriously, this it's, it's just like a business thing. It's that cynical. Faithfully yours in spirit and in body, Louis Maya. And so, Louis founded the Academy Awards of Merit for Distinctive Achievement, which were later shortened to the Big Gold Achievees, and then finally the Academy Awards. So the very first ceremony was held in 1929, and like, all the biggest stars were there, but they also let in a gaggle of slack-jawed commoners. They were allowed to furrow their thick brows at the sight of the movie folk in full color. The color, of course, being white. You see, all you needed to attend was a crisp $5 bill, which at the time was actually roughly the cost of a two-story house, or $75 in today's money. And when the night began, everyone was on the edge of their seats, ready to find out who would win the 12 initial categories. Except not really, because the ceremony wasn't broadcast anywhere. They changed that the next year. But they were probably excited to hear about it in the paper the next day, right? Well, actually, the winners were announced three months in advance in the LA Times. But it's still fun, right? The first category announced was Best Actor, and according to Susan Orlean in her biography of him, the actor who got the most votes initially was a scrappy young pup named Rin Tin Tin. Presumably, Mr. Tin Tin had checked the rule book, and I guess it turned out there was no rule against a dog competing at the Academy Awards, but apparently the Academy didn't like the idea of a dog being one of the first winners, so instead they gave it to respected actor Emil Jennings. In fact, the reason this was the first category of the night was because Emil had to catch a flight to Europe, where he would later use his acting talents for Nazi propaganda films. He even received another award from Minister of Propaganda Joseph Goebbels. After the Third Reich fell, he was said to have held out his trophy and shouted, Don't shoot! I have won an Oscar! I assume he then peed his later hose and cried like a little baby, and waited calmly 15 years for everyone to forget about the whole Nazi thing, and give him a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Anyway, can you imagine how embarrassing it would have been if they gave it to a dog? <laughs> Boy, I bet they're glad they avoided that. By the way, Rin Tin Tin also got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, so... Best Actress went to Janet Gaynor, who at 22 remained the youngest Best Actress winner ever until 1986. That was when Marley Matlin surgically de-aged herself into childhood to play one of the titular children of a lesser god. But for now, Janet Gaynor was truly a star. She won for the classic films Seventh Heaven, Street Angel, and Sunrise. This was actually the only year in which someone could win for multiple films. The Academy later realized this might incentivize actors to work frequently throughout the year, and that would of course give them less time in their personal lives for Louis Meyer to orchestrate like a maniacal perverted puppet master. Charlie Chaplin was initially nominated in several categories for his film The Circus, but the previous year Calvin Coolidge had made it illegal to be multi-talented, so they had to squish all these nominations into a single honorary award. But I mean, come on, it's Charlie Chaplin. He's obviously gonna win a ton of competitive Oscars. It definitely won't take until 1973 for a movie that came out in the 50s in the category of best music, cause, you know, if there's anything Charlie Chaplin should be awarded for, it wasn't acting, directing, or writing, it's sound. 
Speaking of sound, apparently it is unfair competition. The Jazz Singer, which was the first full-length talkie, was not allowed to compete for Best Picture. Apparently it would have been unfair for it to go up against the silent films in the category. So instead it just got a crappy honorary award like Charlie Chaplin. But the Jazz Singer ended up getting the last laugh as this was the first and final year to have a silent Best Picture winner. And no, the artist doesn't count, it did have some sound. Saying the artist is a silent film is like saying the first Academy Award had no Nazis. Later on, founding member of the Academy Joseph Farnham was given the award for best title writing. This was the only year this category existed. It was for those little title card things in silent movies that tell you what the people are saying. But later movies just turned up the volume so you could hear them, so we didn't really need those anymore. And much like silent films, he died in 1931. This made him the first Oscar winner to pass away. However, his fellow nominee Gerald Duffy one-upped him and died a year before he was even nominated. Another one-and-done category was Best Engineering Effects, a category that would die and be reborn and die again and become a Special Achievement Award and then eventually became what is now known as Best Visual Effects. But the first one went to Roy Pomeroy for Wings, which you might have seen coming if you noticed that the other two nominees weren't even associated with a single film. And it wasn't like the actors where they were nominated for multiple films. Nominee Ralph Hammerus was probably nominated for The Private Life of Helen and Troy, but officially he was nominated for nothing. Same goes to Nugent Slaughter, who was nominated for both Best Engineering Effects and, I assume, Most Hardcore Name. The award for Best Director was initially split in two, with one for comedies and one for dramas. Naturally, the Academy quickly merged the categories the next year, as this would have forced them to actually give awards to comedies. Not only were none of the films in the comedy category nominated for anything else, but one of them was that Charlie Chaplin film, The Circus, so the comedies actually lost several nominations. The first and last Academy Award for Best Directing in a Comedy Picture went to Lewis Milestone, presumably so that they could give it to a person whose name was literally Milestone. But of course, the most important category of the night is Best Picture, or at the time, Outstanding Picture. This is now known as the most important category, but the 1929 Academy didn't really care much for it, and they announced it first. The winner was the World War I film Wings. You have to understand that this was before the era of strict censorship in Hollywood, so even though it was the 20s, this movie had blood and guts and boobs and butts and two men kissing and hundreds of pilots and thousands of soldiers, but it was also an uplifting and patriotic romance that appealed to everyone. At the time, it was the biggest hit ever, and it's gone. Probably forever. The original film negatives have been lost since the 20s and are presumed destroyed. Forever. Like, forever, forever. And had Wings not been the first Best Picture winner, there may never have been a way to see it. But by sheer luck, a crappy decaying copy was found gathering dust in the 90s, and they went frame by frame and painstakingly restored it. But even if the physical nitrate film didn't hold up, the movie actually has. Even just looking at Rotten Tomatoes, Wings' 93% looks especially good compared to some of the other early Best Picture winners. I mean, look at The Broadway Melody or Cimarron or Cavalcade. And it's hard not to see Wings' influence on future Best Picture winning romantic war epics like Casablanca, Gone with the Wind, Mrs. Miniver, From Here to Eternity. And its themes are even present in more modern Oscar blockbusters like Titanic or Avatar or Little Italy. It was the biggest and most successful film of its time by almost every measure, and it set the standard for what a Best Picture winner is supposed to look like. But none of that actually mattered, because according to the LA Times, the Academy determined the winner of the category based solely off of box office returns. Like, literally, if you made the most money, you won Best Picture. Oh, how the times have changed. But it actually wasn't the only best picture that year, sort of. Because they also had a category called Unique and Artistic Picture, which the Academy considered to be equal to the award Wings won. This winner was Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans. This was an experimental film with director F.W. Murnau's distinct German expressionist style on full display. It was a bleak, dark romance between unnamed characters with sparse dialogue and heavy emphasis on symbolism. Directors of photography Charles Rauscher and Carl Strauss used techniques like pans, unconventional angles, and tracking shots, which are all common now, but they were really groundbreaking at the time, and it influenced the acclaimed camera work in Citizen Kane. They ended up winning the first Academy Award for Best Cinematography, and the film as a whole is still considered a masterpiece. 
It was certainly deserving of the unique and artistic designation, but at the time, Sunrise was a box office dud. And for an academy designed to improve the scandal-ridden image of Hollywood, the wholesome and popular Wings is always going to win over the confusing and challenging Sunrise. But to see them placed on equal pedestals and praised for their distinctive achievements is a big deal. And I would argue that that is an excellent compromise between awarding commercial success and awarding critical success. Sunrise still remains a fascinating outlier in Oscar history, and it begs the question of whether it should be considered among the pantheon of the best of the best best picture winners. But according to the Academy, no, it shouldn't. The next year, they cut the unique and artistic picture category, and they said retroactively, it is a lesser award than best picture. Best picture is the highest award you can win, and the one that Sunrise won might as well be as good as best title writing. Personally, I'm glad the Academy said this. Now we don't have to turn on our brains and think about things. And just like that, the first Academy Awards came to a close. It only lasted 15 minutes, and if you think that's a really short amount of time, sit down and think about how much time it takes to read out a list of names and then call a winner. The fact that modern Oscars have doubled the categories and somehow last three hours is kind of amazing. Afterwards, everyone went home and began their days, because this Oscar night happened at 8 a.m. They then cried themselves to sleep anyway, because it's the Great Depression and everything sucks. But at least you've got a nice statue. 